Neville. Shh. Don't worry. Ellen's coming. I can hear her on the stairs. Clary settled herself under the blankets again and went back to trying not to think about the what-if things that were keeping her awake. But it seemed impossible to fall asleep when she could hear her little brother Neville wheezing through the walls. What if, when she got to home place tomorrow, her cousins ganged up against her? What if Dad and Zoe were involved in an accident on the way home? What if Zoe decided she wanted Clary to start calling her Mum? How awful that would be! But then a flash of common sense pierced the gloom. Of course, Zoe was never going to ask her to do that. She'd rather be burned at the stake than have anyone think she was old enough to be Clary's mother. Comforted, Clary closed her eyes. Time to make a move, Zoe. I haven't finished my brandy yet. Early start tomorrow. I don't see why we always have to spend our summer holidays in boring old Sussex. Don't you? No. What about the south of France? Both your brothers have taken their wives there. Edward and Vili went for their honeymoon. Well, I've never been there. What do you think? It might be lovely. Oh, you sound as though we shan't go. And please don't say we can't afford it. Darling, apart from that, we can't leave the children. They're perfectly happy with your family. I can't let them do all the work. Are you ready? Not quite. I'll go and get our coats. Before retiring to bed, Rupert's mother and his elder sister Rachel made an inspection of the house, as they did every year before the rest of the Caslett family arrived for their summer holidays. That's everything down here, I think, Duchy. Well, onwards and upwards. Home Place was located on the outskirts of the village of Watlington, which lay between Hastings and the small town of Battle. Do you think we should provide hot water bottles to air the beds? In the height of summer? No, I do not. Rachel knew better than to pursue the subject with her mother. Her Victorian reputation for plain living had long ago earned her the nickname Duchess, shortened over the years to Duchy. Now, where did I put the list of who's sleeping where? We thought Hugh and Sybil in the blue room. Edward and Vili in the peony room, Zoe and Rupert in the Indian room. Rachel adored her brothers equally, but was fondest of all of Rupert. He'd had such a tragic time when Isabel died. He was such a wonderful father and sweet to Zoe, who was so young. She resolved to be particularly kind to her as she followed her mother along the landing. What about Clary? Oh Lord, she'll have to have a camp bed in the pink. <laughs> I think she'll like that. She'll want to be in with the other girls. <laughs> ah, I'm sorry. This arrived in the second post for you. Oh, I put it in my pocket and forgot all about it. Rachel took the letter, looked briefly at the handwriting on the envelope, and immediately felt her heart leap. Good night, then, Duchy, darling. But what about the camp bed? Oh, it won't take me two minutes. <gasps> what would we do without you? Mm -hmm. Good night, Rachel, dear. <laughs> As soon as she was alone, Rachel tore open the letter. My darling Rachel. My darling Rachel, she read. I wonder if you'll ever know how much you are that. I'm not sure how long this will be because I'm writing it in the staff room, and in a few minutes' time, Jenkins Minor will loom to murder a perfectly harmless little piece of bark, <laughs> made all the worse because the only sound I long to hear is your voice. Do you think you could telephone me this afternoon? After school, but before seven, when Evie gets back, it would be absolutely delicious to have you to myself, even if it is for only a few moments on the blower. Rachel felt overwhelmed with disappointment. It was far too late to ring Sid now, and with everyone arriving tomorrow, she worried that a convenient opportunity might not present itself. Here, darling, put it on before we go outside. I should have thought France would be a wonderful place for you to paint. Yes, it would be, but not affordable on a schoolmaster's wage. Anyway, if I have a painting holiday, it has to be just that, not what you would call a holiday at all. I trust you to be so earnest about it. Well, that's exactly what I'm not. If I was earnest, as you put it, I wouldn't be deflected by you or anyone else. What do you mean, anyone else? Oh, I mean that nothing would stop me painting, neither you nor anything else. 
It's all right. I'm not Ernest. I'm hardly Ernest at all. Oh, darling. You sound so sad. And I love you so much. I don't mind us being poor, honestly. <laughs> Driving home, Rupert saw that Zoe had fallen asleep and drove carefully so as not to wake her. I'll carry her up to bed, he thought, and then I'll be able to have a quick look at the children, and she won't know. It's all right, Neville. I'm here. What's brought your asthma on? No, 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 no. Don't try and speak. It'll make you worse. Would you like a story? Right. Now remember the rules? Every time I stop, you have to try and breathe. Hmm? Once upon a time, there was a wicked witch, and the only person she loved in the whole world was a small, black and green... dinosaur, called Staggerflanks. He bent to kiss his son's warm, sweaty forehead. Neville looked startlingly like his mother. Rupert put his hand over his eyes as his last picture of Isabel recurred, lying in their bed exhausted from her thirty-hour labour, trying to smile and bleeding to death. Afterwards he tried to hold her, but she had become a thing, a dead weight in his arms, uncomforting and gone. Daddy? Clary, what are you doing up? I can't sleep. Go back to bed. I'll make you some hot milk and bring it up. Here, drink this, Clary, and then go to sleep. You rages with Neville, Daddy. What were you doing? Telling him a story, helping him to breathe. Oh, he's stupid. Anyone can breathe. People with asthma can find it very difficult. You know that. Don't be unkind and drink up. I don't like hot milk. It gets horrible skin. Don't be silly. Nobody likes me. You don't like me. Oh, that is nonsense. I love you. You've just said I'm unkind, and then you said I was silly. Nobody is perfect. I can still love you. You're perfect. I find you perfect. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there. That shows you. I don't like the skin on milk either, but I ate it for you. Daddy, I love you so much. I wish you were the king. Why? Because then you'd be home all day. Kings are. Well, the holidays start tomorrow, so I will be. Now, I'm going to tuck you up. Good night. Sleep tight. Hmm. You've been a long time. <sighs> Neville had a rather bad attack. I've been getting him to sleep and then... Well, that woke Clary. You never have thought what it's like for me. Never feeling that I've got you to myself. <laughs> you know, darling. I think you'd feel quite differently about family life if you had a baby. If we had a baby. Not yet. You keep saying that, but we've been married three years. I don't feel old enough. Maybe when Sybil has the new baby, you'll feel differently. Maybe when I'm her age. She must be at least 40. Oh, she wouldn't thank you for saying that. She's only 38. I'm only 23. Yeah. And you said we couldn't afford a foreign holiday. So how can you afford a baby? Well, it was just a thought. Think about it. Hmm? Do I have to? <laughs> oh, Rupert, darling. Mm. And recognising her desire, he felt his own and kissed her and then couldn't stop. She tried her best to push all thoughts of pregnancy out of her mind. Look at Rupert's first wife. She died that way, having Neville. But even if Zoe didn't die, she feared her figure would be ruined, which was just as bad. Dad, I feel sick. Not again. 
Put your head close to the window, Clary. Can't I sit in the front? No. You should have gone with Neville and Ellen on the train, like I told you. Not long now. You've been saying that all day. It had been an awful journey down to home place. Their small Morris was not large enough for the whole family, and Clary had luggage crammed around her in the back. Quite soon she became car sick, and they had to stop. Then they had a puncture, and Rupert had had to change the wheel, while Zoe sat smoking and not saying a word. But they were at last approaching the house, and Rupert felt his spirits lift. There you are. We were beginning to get worried about you. Oh, I suppose we're the last. I'm afraid so. No. <laughs> you and Edward arrived in time for lunch. Harry was sick on the way down. She's perfectly all right now. Are you? Yes, thanks, Aunt Rachel. Well, you're just in time for tea. The others are all in the dining room. And once the words were out of her mouth, Rachel realised that this would be her opportunity. She would wait until they were all sitting down to tea and slip into her father's study where the telephone was. Rupert, hmm? where did you put my book? Rupert, you must have left it in the car. Clary will fetch it for you, won't you, darling? Thank you, Clary. There's an angel. Clary trotted off. She had never felt less like an angel in her life. Zoe had only said that to make it sound as though she was fond of her, and she jolly well wasn't. And I'm not fond of her, she thought, not remotely. I hate her. She didn't hate anyone else, which showed she wasn't generally a hating sort of person. But Zoe made her feel wicked. She wished Zoe would die from eating potted meat in a heat wave, which could kill you, according to the Dutchy. She opened the car door and found the book, and then shut her eyes and held her breath to try to stop her thoughts. I'm so sorry I didn't manage to ring yesterday, Sid. I didn't get your letter until it was too late. Doesn't matter, Rachel, darling. Let's make a plan to meet. Can we? before Evie comes in. Um. <clears throat> ah. Hmm. All right. Lovely. Edward always asked his wife that afterwards, and Villy always replied, lovely. She called it a white lie to herself, and over the years it had come to have an almost cosy ring. Of course she loved him, so what else could she say? Sex was for men, after all. Women, nice women, were not expected to care for it. But her own mother had intimated, the only time she'd ever remotely touched upon the subject, that it was the gravest possible mistake to ever refuse one's husband. So Villy had never refused Edward. Penny for them. I just hope Louise and Polly don't leave Clary out. Why would they? You know, three's a crowd. I'm not sure that I do. I think I'll see if the bathroom's free. I suppose it's different for boys. <clears throat> Run me a bath, darling. I'll do that thing. If anyone had ever asked him if he were in love with his wife, Edward would have said of course he was. Mm -hmm. He would not have added that in spite of 18 years of relative happiness, Villy did not really like the bedside of life. It didn't matter to him because there were so many girls to go for. How lucky he was. Darling, you're dressing for work. Well, the firm won't run itself. I thought it had been agreed that Hugh would go in until Sybil has the baby. Now, too much for him to cope with on his own. What about the brig? This was the family's nickname for Edward's father, the Brig, shortened from Brigadier, because much to his regret, he had never served in the army. I'll try to be back for dinner. This is our summer holiday. No rest for the wicked, eh? Do you think we should have waited for Clary? Oh, Polly, I don't see why. She doesn't even like our tree. She is our cousin, but she's not our friend. Whereas we're friends, as well as cousins. She is sharing a room with us, Louise. It's not our fault if we don't like her very much. Even though Mummy says I ought to because of her not having a mother. She has Aunt Zoe. She doesn't strike me as a particularly good mother. Or for glam, but not a mother. Some people aren't cut out for that sort of thing, you know. 
I mean, look at Lady Macbeth. I don't think Aunt Zoe is like Lady Macbeth. I know you think Shakespeare is wonderful, but honestly, people now aren't much like his people. They jolly well are. But I suppose you're right about Aunt Zoe. She is quite a lot nicer than Lady Macbeth. I wouldn't have learnt about the curse if it wasn't for her. Is that what it means? Out, out, damn spot? No, not from Lady Macbeth. From Aunt Zoe. I bet you don't even know what it is. I do. Mummy told me. I just hope I won't get it for ages and ages. My mother didn't even warn me. I thought I was going to die. How did she explain it? She said it was a horrid thing that happened to girls once a month for years and years. It was disgusting, but quite ordinary. When I asked her, how could a quite ordinary thing be disgusting? She said she didn't wish to discuss it now. It's something to do with having babies. I asked her about that as well, and she just said, "Never you mind." Ever since that conversation, Louise had watched her mother for signs of affection, and the opposite. Then written them down in her secret diary and added them up each month. The fact that Villy, unlike Polly's mother, hadn't warned her about the curse before it had happened, as though she had meant her to be frightened, would now be added to the opposite column. Oh look! It's still here. <laughs> to their delight, the piece of rope. Which they'd used to get up the trunk of the tree hung just where they had left it last year. They collected bunches of daisies, and Louise put them in her pocket for the climb. Hugh Cazalet had dealt with the mail, but it hadn't left him enough time to check the elm at the wharf before his lunch appointment. As he lit a gold flake, he could feel one of his heads coming on. He looked out of the office window. Trying not to wish he were back at home place with his beloved wife Sybil and daughter Polly, but as his father was fond of pointing out, the building trade would always need timber, and the summer was a particularly busy season. Morning, your boy, Edward. What are you doing here? I thought I'd make myself useful. You said you'd come in once Sybil has the baby, so I could take some time off. And I will, I will. Well, I can't pretend I'm not glad you're here. I've got a mountain. Actually, your boy, I'm rather hoping this afternoon might be an Armani night. This. To some mysterious reference to a well-known advertisement for shampoo, meant Edward was having an affair, never mentioned overtly between them, but known by Hugh as surely as if it were. What have you got on? Something you're not looking forward to, by the looks. Hugh's headaches could never be mentioned. He became irritable and then furious at any concern, which made Edward feel worse. He loved his brother. And felt rotten about having survived the war unscathed when his brother had had such bloody awful health because of it.、Uh, lunch with that architect employed rather too much, in my opinion, by the board of trade. Bit of luck might result in a substantial order for mahogany. Of veneers, mainly for the lifts of a large office block. Well, I'm happy to do it. Leave you free to check the samples of elm at the wharf. If you're sure you can fit it in. Of course. Now, if you don't mind, I need to use the blower. Comfortably ensconced in the best branch that went up at one end, so they could sit facing each other, leaning their backs against the branch and the trunk respectively, Louise divided the daisies, and she and Polly made chains to decorate the tree. Below them, past the orchard, they could see the duchy in her large hat, snipping and bending over her roses in the garden. Oh look, there's Clary. Where? On the path between the greenhouses. On her own. She's probably seeing what she can get to eat. You know what she's like. She does look a bit lonely. Paul, we don't want to be stuck with her for the rest of the day. I know. Hello. Diana, it's me. Oh, darling. Sorry to be so long. Thought you must be out. I was at the end of the garden. Are you on your own? For the moment. Are you? For the moment, I'm at the office. I thought you were with your family in Sussex. No, I couldn't keep away.、Uh, I had no idea you found the timber business so riveting. <laughs> <laughs> Will you be at home later this afternoon? Yes. What about the boys? Ian and Fergus are still up north with their grandmother. And Angus? He's with them. 
There's just Jamie and me. Hooray. What? Hooray. Good. You know what I mean. I sort of think I do. You're still here. Oh. I'll call round after my lunch appointment. Thank you for doing business with Cazalet and Sons. Sorry, I, I didn't realize. Just off now, old boy. But uh, don't expect me back today. Hugh's unease on Villiers' behalf made his headache worse, which in turn triggered memories of France. Hugh had been wounded, and Edward had somehow contrived to visit him in the military hospital before he was shipped back to England. Take extra care of him, matron, because he is my brother. And the gaunt battle axe of a matron had smiled and looked twenty years younger and said, Of course, Major Cazalet. How did he get a pass? I didn't. I said, pass? I'm an E-D-W-A-R-D. And they said, sorry, sir, and let me through. And Hugh had found himself <laughs> starting to laugh, but in fact crying helplessly. Edward sat on his bed and held his remaining hand and then mopped him up with a silk handkerchief that smelled of home. Poor old boy. Did they get the shrapnel out of your head? He'd nodded, but of course they hadn't. Some of it had gone too far in. When Edward got up to leave, he'd kissed him, something they did not usually do. You look after yourself, old chap. And you. You bet. Edward had walked away down the ward without looking back, and Hugh had lain there, watching the doors at the end of the ward, still swinging gently, long after he'd gone, and worried that he would never see him again. Only he did come back. They both did. But the funny thing was, Edward didn't seem changed at all. Seemed to be just as he had been before they both went to France. Was full of energy and japes. Would stay up all night dancing and go to work all day, fresh as a daisy. Girls fell for him easily. He was always having little gold pencils and bracelets engraved with their names. He never mentioned the war. It was as though it had been like a particularly nasty boarding school where death and mutilation, rather than mere bullying, had been the norm. But now he was out, on the other side of it, into eternal holidays. Diana. Hmm? I suppose I'd better be off. Must you, darling? Yeah. Oh. When my sister-in-law, Sybil, has the baby... Hugh will stay down in Sussex, and I'll be in London all the time. Angus and the boys will be back by then. I know. The house in Lansdowne Road will be empty and absolutely at our disposal. I do love you. Entirely reciprocated. Entirely. Mm. Rice pudding was just horrible. Is that bad? Good. Jazz. Girls, where's Clary? We don't know. Honestly, Aunt Villy, we'd clean forgotten about her, Mummy. She didn't come for supper. We left our bathwater for her. Everybody's looking for her. She's disappeared. I'll check the schoolroom. It's not our fault. Yes, it is. We've avoided her all day. Blast. The trouble is, Clary makes me feel so awful. And that makes me not like her. She doesn't make you feel awful. It's how we are to her that does. She's not there. Well, it's probably just sulking. Now, listen, you two. You mustn't gang up on Clary. How would you like it if either of you were the one left out? We honestly didn't gang up. We promised we won't any more, Aunt Villy. I blame you, Louise, most, because you're the oldest. Shall we go and look for her? No. One of you may fetch her supper from the schoolroom. I am very displeased with you, Louise. I'm sorry. I'm truly... Sorry. She hates me. Well, we have been avoiding her. Not Clary. My mother. Polly, what are you doing out of bed? I was worried about Clary, Daddy. Well, they found her asleep in Aunt Rachel's room. So she's staying there tonight. I'm sorry. I did leave her out, but I didn't really want to. Not really. I'm sure you didn't, darling. Now go on, back to bed. Good night, Daddy. Night, night. Hugh watched his daughter go back to her room. He never told anyone how much she meant to him. But whenever he thought of her, he felt so very lucky. She was like a secret treasure.
I honestly think that if only Zoe made the slightest attempt to pull her weight as a stepmother, poor little Clary would be a much easier child. Well, Zoe's awfully young, you know. I expect she finds the family en masse a bit overwhelming. I like her. I know you do. Well, it's good that someone likes her. Apart from Rupert, of course. I don't think he likes her. He's mad about her. That's not the same thing at all. Oh, that's too subtle for me, I'm afraid. <sighs> Darling... You know perfectly well what I mean. She's full of S.A. Mm. Edward, who was well aware of Zoe's sex appeal, but sensed it was dangerous ground, changed the subject. Comfy, Villa, darling. He started kissing her and feeling with one hand for the short, soft, curly hair at the back of her neck. Villa strained away from him for a moment, but she was only turning off the light. Please try and make sure that Sybil doesn't get roped into going to the beach, Mother. I know she's not due for another few weeks, but it looks like it's going to be a scorcher. Of course. Quite unsuitable in her condition. There are plenty of aunts and uncles to supervise the children. <laughs> See you on Friday, then, Dutchie dearest. Hugh resisted the impulse to say goodbye to his wife, not wishing to wake her. They had the happiest of marriages, where each put the other's feelings above their own, or rather, what they imagined the other's feelings to be. Sybil lay in bed, thoroughly awake, longing for Hugh to come up, but not wanting to call out to him for fear of making him late, or worrying him unnecessarily. Rule number one, no sticks in the house. It's a fishing net. Yes, I know it's a fishing net, level, but the larger part of it is a long stick. Rachel, I thought you'd left. I'm just about to. Sorry, I'm so late for breakfast. Sybil, dear, what's happened? I think I've twisted my ankle. Here, let me get you a chair. <laughs> I lost my balance getting out of the bath. Yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you. Let me have a look. Oh, sorry. You really ought to keep it up. If I bring this stool over, you can rest it on that. Are you sure everything else is all right? Oh, yes, it's just the ankle. I could bandage it up. Are you sure? Rachel was in the voluntary aid detachment. No, I meant are you sure you've got time? You look dressed to go out. I will have a word with Tunbridge. There really is no need. You won't have time to cycle now, not if you want to meet the train. I'll tell Mrs. Cripps of the one more for lunch. Oh, honestly, I'll be fine. I just need to rest a bit. Maybe I'll sit here and read the paper. Take this. If you need anything, Sybil, just ring. I'm so sorry. I've got to go. When she was alone, Sybil glanced at the morning paper, which had what looked like a rather worrying piece about Mussolini on the front page. But she didn't get to read it because she became aware of a twinge on her spine, not hurting exactly, but menacing, with the promise of pain. She remembered it now. I must get up, she thought. And as she did so, she felt her waters breaking. Sid! Sid! Rachel! Hello. Hello. I'll carry your case. You will not, not with your back. What's your bicycle? I thought you said on the blower you were going to cycle to meet me. I'm afraid we've got Tunbridge and lunch at home. The duchy insisted. Oh. But I thought we could have a lovely walk afterwards and take tea with us so we wouldn't have to come back for it. But if we take a picnic, won't the children want to come? Oh, they're all at the beach. They won't be back until tea time. Ah. The plot thins in the most admirable manner. And I thought you might stay the night. Oh, dear heart, I can't. I've agreed to give private tuition to Jenkins Minor. And there's Evie. Oh, how is she? Evie was Sid's sister, renowned for willful ill health. No worse than usual. Except she's on, on, on at me to take her somewhere on holiday. <sighs> there, there, my dear. It'll be a lovely baby, you'll see. I think perhaps I could telephone you. Oh, no, please don't. I don't want him worried. <laughs> Oh, Rachel, thank goodness. Eileen told me. Oh, 
You stay with Sybil. I'll see to Charles. The maids are boiling water. And has someone telephoned Dr. Carr? Let's hope that's him now. Oh, oh I'm sorry about that. It's all a bit Mary Webbish, isn't it? Is it? Oh, dear Sybil, I'm not nearly as well read as you. Straining at bedposts and all that. Oh. Here, Dr. Carr. Well, well, Mrs. Cassidy. I hear you had a bit of a fall in the bath this morning. Yes. And your baby's decided to make its way out. Yes. Uh, we'll be needing some hot water. Perhaps you'd arrange that, Miss Rachel, while I examine the patient. Yes, of course, Doctor. But I need you back in five minutes. My usual midwife's out on the case, and she won't be able to get here till later this afternoon. Oh, Sid. I should so love to play a sonata or two with you. But I fear it's neither the time nor the place. I'm perfectly fine entertaining myself, dear Duchy, if you feel you're needed elsewhere. I do feel as though I should ring you. Oh, of course you must. But Sybil begged me not to. She doesn't want him worried. Oh, it seems so wrong to do exactly what she doesn't want. I don't think that's the point. I think Hugh would mind very much if he hadn't been told what was going on. Of course you're <laughs> right. <laughs> Sensible, Sid. I'm so glad you're here. I'll do it at once. Where's the duchy? On the blower to Hugh. Here, have a gasper. You look like you need one. Oh, thank you. Most ghastly pain, I didn't realise. Has the midwife arrived? No, and can't get here until this afternoon, apparently. Dr Carr said I've got five minutes, and then he's going to instruct me what to do. Poor thing. Yeah, she's being tremendously brave. Well, actually, I meant you. I'm sorry about our day. Can't be helped. The plan is that Mrs. Critz should make a picnic tea and I should deflect the beach party. That keep the children in the garden, out of the way, until it's over. Jolly good. It's curious, isn't it? How for the most important events in people's lives, everybody has to keep out of the way, know nothing about it. Oh, but they might hear her. Not that Sybil would make a sound if she could possibly help it. Exactly. I must get back. Would you ask the duchy to get one of the maids to bring me an apron? Of course. Tell me if there's anything I can do. Yeah, I will. God bless. Well, you're doing very well now, Mrs. Cazalet. <laughs> now, when the next pain starts, take a deep breath and really push. Yes, it is. Yes, yes, your baby's on its way, but you must help. <laughs> now, don't fight the pains. Ride them. Go with them. You're nearly there. <laughs> A beautiful boy. Miss Rachel? Rachel, can you uh, please sponge him? Rachel watched Sybil's face as she looked at the little blooded creature and then found herself in tears. The room was suddenly full of excitement and love. He's not made of glass. He won't break. Uh, you suppose? Hold his head and sponge him down. Like so. That's right. Ah. After we've dried him, we put him on the scale. Just over seven pounds or I'm a Dutchman, but we'll need to be sure. Oh. Uh, what is it? I can see Miss Pearson, my midwife, bicycling up the drive. You are relieved of your duties, Miss Cazalet. But it's all over by the shouting, isn't it? <laughs> Far from it, Miss Rachel. Mrs. Cazalet is expecting twins. Um... Hello? Hello? Oh, Hugh, Hugh. Now, sorry I've been so long, but at least I've got the baby clothes. You have a beautiful little boy. When? About 20 minutes ago. <sighs> Dr. Carr doesn't think the other one will take so long. Is he fine? He's wonderful. <laughs> Did Sybil have a bad time? I don't think it's ever exactly a picnic. She was marvellous, very brave. <sighs> Hugh longed to be with Sybil but did not want to impose himself for fear of distressing her. And Sybil, who wanted more than anything for Hugh to have been with her, didn't like to request this in case it upset him unduly. Oh, Hugh. You're here. What? What is it? I'm sorry. I am so sorry, darling. The second one was breach. 
Dr. Carr did his very best, but sadly... Do you think I can see Sybil? In a while. She wants everything to be ship-shaped first. Half an hour later, after they'd given him a fine drop of whiskey, Dr. Carr climbed wearily into his old Ford to drive home. In the old days, he used to come home full of tales of deliveries. But after they lost both their sons in the war, his wife couldn't stand to hear about babies or children. He thought of Donald and Ian, who were never spoken about at home, who would, he felt, be entirely forgotten except for his own memory, and their names on the village monument. Let's just go as far as that oak and sit for a bit. Good idea. My back isn't holding up too well. You should have said. What about here? I must say, you look dead beat. The awful thing is that I can't help being glad I wasn't there for the second. I would have loved. Darling, if you had, it wouldn't have been the end of the world, you know. Crying isn't a crime. Well, we were brought up to think that part of growing up was learning not to cry. Except at music and being patriotic and things like that. So Elgar would have been a hole in one, you mean? <laughs> <laughs> Dead right. <laughs> oh, Sid, I just thought of something. If your sister really does want to have a holiday, why don't you invite her down here? No, I don't want to do that. Why on earth not? Because I'd be afraid of her finding out. Finding out what? About us. You and me. <laughs> Darling, there's nothing really for her to find out. Oh, she's a very jealous person, possessive. You're all she has in the world. I think that's understandable. Do you? But Rachel, being Rachel, didn't recognize any irony in Sid's voice. It is so lovely that you're here now. <laughs> Sid put her arms around her and kissed her for the first time that day. An exquisite but different pleasure for each of them. I'm sorry. They wouldn't let me come up before, you know. It was twins. Oh, darling girl, it's all right. No, it isn't. He tried to make her breathe. Dr. Carr worked on her little chest long, long after he needed to. But she never breathed. All that and she never took one breath. I know, darling. But what about the lovely boy? May I see him? He's over there. He's fast asleep. He's, he's all right. There's nothing wrong with him. But I know that you wanted a girl. I already have a beautiful daughter. He looks marvellous. Yes. The other one was so much smaller. So tiny. Pitiful. When I touched her, her head was still warm. No one will ever have known her but me. I so want to hold you. <laughs> Experiencing Hugh's pain seemed much worse to Sybil than coping with her own. All she wanted now was to make it better for him. It's all right. When he awakes, you'll see how beautiful he is. You mustn't be sad, and you're right. We already have a lovely daughter. Hugh laid her carefully back on the pillow, smoothing her hair, softly kissing her mouth, telling her that she was right, that they had Polly, and that he loved her and his new son. When Eileen came in with tea, they were holding hands.
Ah. Edward tells me you're going up to London with him today, Billy. I must say I'm green with envy. You wouldn't be, Zoe, if you knew the reason. I think I'd put up with anything if I could just go dancing again. I don't know how you can bear it. Bear what? Being stuck down here with nothing more exciting to do than jigsaws. You used to be a professional dancer, didn't you? Well, with the Russian ballet. Were you on stage every night? While we were on tour, yes. It seems unbelievable to me that you would exchange a life like that for looking after children and... Doing jigsaws. Well, most people believe that if a marriage isn't the woman's career, then it won't be a good marriage. At least you're getting away today. Will you go to the ballet while you're in town? I shouldn't think so. I have to have all my teeth out. All of them? I haven't told anyone else. That's awful. I shall have to get used to it. It'll all be the same in a hundred years hence. Haven't you... Haven't you even told Edward? Oh, yes, but only him. He's driving me up to the dentist. Does he mind? I don't think so. After all, he's had most of his out. It's different for us, though, isn't it? Everything's different for women. Yes. I wonder why. Oh, there you are, Zoe. There's someone on the blower for you. Me? Who is it? A GP didn't quite catch the name. Said he was your mother's quack. Oh. Excuse me? Hmm. Aunt Rachel said you were going up to London for a couple of days. Can I come? No, right. Louise. Ed- Edward... Oh, go on, Mummy. Oh, I don't see why not. Thank you, Daddy. It'll be so lovely being back in my own room after having to share with Polly and Clary. Ah, I'll go and get ready. Zoe, darling, what are you doing? Packing a case. I didn't turn the brig down point blank. I said I'd think about it. This isn't about your father offering you a job. No? No. Even though if you did take it, it would mean we wouldn't have to worry about things like getting a new car, school fees for Neville, or even Clary. She could go to boarding school. If you wanted to paint, you still could in your holiday. I'd only get a fortnight. I can't manage to paint now in the long school holiday. I don't want to argue any more about it. So why are you packing your bags? It's it's my mother. Her doctor rang to tell me she's had a heart attack. Oh, I'm so sorry. She's not dead. She wants to see me. Oh, you must stay as long as you need. I'm rather hoping I won't have to stay. If it's easier to look after her in our house, you could move her there. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> I don't think she would like that. I'm sure Mummy would far rather be in her own home. Let me drive you to the station. Edward and Villy have offered me a lift. Have you got enough money, darling? I think so. Here, take another five pounds, just to be on the safe side. Thank you. I am sorry. Thank you. And I know you'll make the right decision about the job. The secret list that Louise had been compiling about signs of affection from Villy unexpectedly grew that afternoon when she found her mother on the sofa in the drawing room of their home in London, crying. Something she had never seen before in her life. What's the matter, Mummy? What is it? Oh, please, what's the matter? Oh, Louise. Your face. It's all puffy and bruised. They have taken all my teeth out. Oh, (laughs) darling mummy. I don't want to worry you, but they seem to still be there. (laughs) He made me put them in at once, the new ones. But, oh, Louise, they do hurt rather. Wouldn't it be better if you took them out? Just for a little while. He said to keep them in. Shall I get you some aspirin? I have taken some, but it doesn't seem to have done much good. Do you think it would be all right if I took some more? Yes, I do. And I think it would be better if I put you to bed with a hot water bottle. In fact, I'll tell Phyllis to make me... I don't want the servants to see me like this. No, of course not. Mummy... I'll look after you. I'll see to everything. You're a good little nurse. Would you like me to stay with you? No, darling, I'll try and sleep. But thank you. Louise sat on the curb of the stairs, 
so she could hear if Lily called. So moved was she by her mother's plight, and by being treated, she felt at last like a grown-up, that she started to wonder if perhaps she ought not to sacrifice her dreams of a Hollywood career to become a nurse. She was imagining herself gliding about darkened wards at night with a lamp. Louise, Lou, huh? What on earth are you doing sitting up there in the dark? Oh, Daddy, I didn't hear you come in. Where's your mother? I put her to bed with two hot water bottles. She's asleep. Ah,、oh, jolly good. You're such a lovely girl. She asked me to tell you not to wake her. Ah, in that case, I wonder whether you would care to dine with me tonight, Miss Cazalet, if you have no previous engagement. <laughs> I do happen to be free. Run along and change then. Meet you in the drawing room in twenty minutes. Kensington seven four five one. Hello, Zoe, sweetie. It's only me. How are things? <gasps> ghastly, Rupert. Simply ghastly. Has she taken a turn for the worse? No, there's nothing much wrong with her as far as I can see. But I've had to buy a bedpan for her to use. Can you imagine? Oh no, don't. And then she took it into her head that she fancied a bit of fresh fish. I've had to walk miles. Do you know how to cook fish? A very nice woman in the fishmonger's told me. Between two plates on the top of a saucepan. But what she neglected to tell me is that the plates would get hot. So now I've burnt my hand, and the whole flat stinks of fish. You poor thing. I wish I could do something to make it better. Have you thought about it? What? Your father's offer to go into the firm. I have not reached a conclusion yet. You know, it would make me feel a great deal better if you said yes. Oh, that's the doorbell. I have to go. Who is it at this time of the evening? The doctor. He said he'd call back to check on her. Good night, then, darling. Night. Coming. Sorry to keep you waiting, Doctor Sherlock. I was on the telephone. How's the patient been? Please come in and see for yourself. Louise changed into the dress that Edward had given her for Christmas, the one that her mother disapproved of, on the grounds that it was too grown up. She lingered in front of the mirror before going downstairs. I say, you do look smart. Do I? Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, we've time for a little sherry before we go. She seems very settled. The sedative is already starting to take effect. Thank you. Do you have any plans? Plans? For the evening. How you'll spend it? Oh, not really. Um, my friends all seem to be away, and I don't care to go to the cinema by myself. Still, I really shouldn't complain. That really prevents one from doing so. I find、huh. I can complain as well. My wife took the children to Hunt Stanton for what was supposed to be a fortnight. Now it's three weeks and no sign of them returning.、Oh, poor you. I don't suppose you'd care to dine with me, if you have nothing better to do. Um, no, I, I don't. I'd、uh, better tell my mother though. Well, she'll be fast asleep now. If left undisturbed, she'll sleep all through the night. And so Philip Sherlock took Zoe Cazalet to Prunier's, and over there sold Veronique and Chablis. They exchanged those elliptical, fascinating, and often misleading pieces of information about themselves that paved the path to physical attraction. How long have you been married? Nearly four years.、You、must have been very, very young then. Nineteen. A child. <laughs> and the children? My husband was married before. The children I mentioned were by his first wife. You're very young to take on stepchildren. Well, yes, it is sometimes difficult. I had wanted to go on the stage at one time, but of course, marriage put an end to all that. I can quite see why you would have wanted to go on the stage. <laughs> What about yourself? Nothing much to tell. I'm a GP, as you already know. The practice is fairly large, and I have a house in Redcliffe Square. How long have you been married? Twelve years. Two children, and my wife dislikes London. She inherited some money from her father and bought a cottage in Norfolk with it. And that's where she and the children are now. Yes, she has difficulty tearing herself away from it. I'm not too keen on the country myself. 
I much prefer the town. Oh, yes, so do I. How extraordinary that we should be so alike. Excuse me. Dr. Sherlock has a telephone call for you. Oh, thank you. Um, please excuse me a moment. How is Mummy doing? Uh, she's feeling lots better, and she says it's time you went to bed, and she'd like to say goodnight to you. Oh, Daddy, I'm not in the least bit tired. Uh, of course not, but all the same. <laughs> Thank you for a lovely evening. Mm. Good night, my darling girl. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Surprisingly, he then kissed her on her mouth. His moustache was bristly, and for a second she felt something soft and wet, and realised it was his tongue. It was horrible. <laughs> She supposed it had somehow slipped out by mistake and felt embarrassed for him and wriggled out of his arms. Good night, then. I'm terribly sorry, Zoe, but we'll have to go. I have to make a visit to a very sick patient. It's a pity. I was hoping to take you on somewhere to dance. Were you? How did they know you were at this restaurant? I always leave a number with any serious case if I'm going out. It's all part of the job. I've already paid the bill. Do you mind if I find you a cab and don't see you home? Of course not. Thanks for the dinner. It was lovely to go out. It was lovely to go out with you. Hmm. Perhaps we could go dancing on another occasion. Perhaps. He watched as she got into a cab. She waved and he blew her a kiss. It was the first time she'd gone to dinner alone with a man who was not Rupert since her marriage, and she felt herself back on ground that was both familiar and exciting. Good night, Mummy. Good night, darling. Did you have a nice evening with Daddy? Uh, yes. We had a fish souffle and roast pheasant and then angels on horseback and came home and played the gramophone. Good, darling. And thank you so much for being sweet to me. Is it better? Is it hurting much less? I think it is. I'm going to take some more aspirin and Daddy's going to sleep in the dressing room tonight. All right. Um, good night. Louise suddenly realised that she wanted to get to her room quickly and shut the door before her father came up. Darling, how was your day? Managed a cup of tea, just. New teeth take some getting used to, I should know. All be the same a hundred years hence. That's the spirit. Why don't I take you and Louise to the theatre this evening to cheer us all up? I can't go out. Not like this, with my face still puffed up like a balloon. I could take Louise then. She needs a treat. You took her out last night. Only for a meal. She does love the theatre. Well, don't keep her up too late. And please, don't give her any drink. It only makes her irritable. She's growing up, darling. She needs some fun. She might be 15, but she's still only a child. Here she is. I thought you'd still be at work. You see what I mean, Edward? She's like a bear with a sore head. Well, I need to make a telephone call. I'll leave your mother to tell you the good news. What good news? You're going to the theatre tonight. Are you coming? No, just you and your father. You could look a bit more pleased about it. When are we going back to home place? If you're going to be so ungrateful and sulky about a treat, people won't want to give you any more of them. Good. Louise, you were only moaning a couple of days ago about not liking it down there because you had to share a room with your cousins. I've changed my mind. There is just no pleasing you. <sighs> Darling Sid, do eat your cake. I suppose if I can't have it, I'd better. What do you mean? Oh, you know the expression. You can't have your cake and eat it. I've never really understood it. What else can you do with cake but eat it? Quite. 
but it's extraordinary how we're brought up to deprive ourselves and put our own desires last. Are you cross with me? No, no, never. Oh, Rachel, don't mind me. I always feel blue when you go. Why don't I wrap this up and take it to eat on the bus on the way home? Better still, have another piece for the bus. Have mine. I don't want it a bit. Oh, is something wrong? Is it your back? No, that osteopath is wonderful. Well worth the journey. Not so much as a twinge all afternoon. I'm so pleased. So am I. And of course, coming to London for an appointment with him also means I can spend some time with you. <laughs> Here you are. If you're sure you don't want it. Walnut cake reminds me of going back to school. The Dutch used to take me out to tea, but I always felt homesick and couldn't eat anything. So do have it. Righty-ho. You know I'd stay up if I possibly could. You possibly could, thought Sid, if you weren't so damnably unselfish. My darling, I've come to accept that you live for others. It's just that sometimes I wish I could be one of them. But you couldn't ever be. I see. I'd always rather be with you than anyone else in the world. Sid found herself unable to speak. She put her hand over Rachel's. Maybe we should have another pot of tea. But your train? I don't think it would matter so awfully much if I caught the later one. Let's go for a walk, then. Are you sure you wouldn't like a drink? Uh, no, thank you. Are you enjoying it? Quite. Thought you wanted to be an actress? Yes, a serious one. This is a musical. Hmm. But it's got some catchy tunes, don't you think? Come on, second act's about to begin. Uh. <clears throat> Any time your Lambeth way, any evening, any day, you'll find us all doing the Lambeth walk. Oi! Daddy, come on. Maybe they should audition me. I could be Lupino Lane's understudy. What do you think? I don't think you should hand in your notice to the brick just yet. <laughs> Louise had declined the proffered drinks. She had chosen clothes that had made her less want to look in the mirror the minute she put them on. And it had worked. Nothing had happened. She became more confident in her belief that last night had just been a drunken mistake. Her father had been exactly as he used to be. It was as though nothing had happened. And she started to look forward to seeing the second half of Me and My Girl. My girl meant for each other, sent for each other, and liking it so. Me and my girl it's such a beautiful evening. Doesn't it feel odd to you? Every day we seem to be creeping, slipping into a ghastly nightmare. But we go on as though nothing much is happening. Well, darling, what else can we do? It isn't as though we, any of us, have the slightest power to do anything else. Do you mean we never had it? Or that we had some and simply elected the wrong people? Well, I don't think we've particularly elected the wrong people. I think the general climate is bad. Ignorance, prejudice, complacency. Us or the Germans or both? Well, the Germans are in a different position. Things have been bad enough for them to change at any price. Do you think they want a war? I think they expect it. I don't think people leave their country and everything they have for nothing. What people? The Jews. But they aren't, are they? I've never heard that. They've been leaving since 1936 to come here or to America. Just because you happen to know one or two. Oh, I agree. It's a very small number in comparison to how many are left. But it's a sign. If I had to worry about whether the balloon was going up, that's the factor I should have taken most notice of. But, Sid, darling, that's because... <laughs> that's because... Because I'm half Jewish? <laughs> You're probably right. It may not be my pure intelligence, it may simply be fear. N now I've lost you. Oh, well, never mind. Oh, Sid, I don't understand, but I'm listening. I want to know what you feel. I know. I know. Look at the time. We must catch your blasted train. Rachel took Sid's hand, and they walked in silence with their fingers entwined until they reached the platform barrier at Charing Cross. Want me to see you off? No, you run and catch your bus. It's been such a lovely afternoon and evening. Hasn't it just? Goodbye, my darling. Mind you ring. I will. Sid put two fingers on Rachel's face. Stopped for a moment when she reached her mouth to receive the minute, trembling kiss. Then she turned clumsily away 
and walked out of the station without looking back. Fares, please. Any more fares? Move right along, please. That's right. Don't go upstairs. The bed's half made. Oh, all right, you can if you insist. Sid caught the 53 bus at the corner of Trafalgar Square and went upstairs to a seat right at the front. She paid for her fourpenny ticket before she went up. She settled herself, blew her nose, and tried to be what Rachel would call sensible. But what started happening at once, as it always did at times like these, was resentment, bitter and continuous, and on a scale that she utterly concealed from her darling Rachel. She could understand that the brig was getting on a bit, but why did that make Rachel the person who had to look after him? He was married, wasn't he? What about the duchy doing her bit for a change? Why should Rachel feel that her parents, both of them, depended on her so entirely? Why did they not see that she was entitled to a life of her own? But then the image of Rachel's face in the tea shop when she said, I'd rather be with you than with anybody in the world, recurred. That painful declaration dropped deeply into Sid's heart was balm indeed. She does love me. Me, of all people. She has chosen to love me. What more can I ask than that? Not a damn thing. <laughs> She replayed it in her mind for the rest of the journey. I'd always rather be with you than anyone else in the world. <laughs> the sun has got his hat on. Hip, 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 hooray. The sun has got his hat on and he's coming out to play. Shush, Daddy. You wait, Mummy. Are you sure you won't have a nightcap with me, Lou? Yes, quite sure. Thank you for a lovely evening. I'm going to bed. <laughs> Good night, then, sweetheart. Good night. No but then he kissed her in the same horrible way. Only this time, he put his hand under her frock and hurt her breast. And his other arm was so tightly round her that she couldn't stop it. You're so grown up now. Uh, no, let me go! Louise? She broke away from him and ran up the stairs. But she'd forgotten her long dress. Her heel caught in the skirt and she had to stop to free it. And as she straightened up, she looked down. And she saw him standing there, looking up at her, smiling. Louise? He had become the enemy. Once in her room, Louise shut the door with her whole weight behind it and felt possessed by some nameless terror, like a terrible dream. Only it wasn't a dream. He would come up the stairs any minute. He might come into her room, no key. How could she stop him? This thought occurred, recurred, 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 but she could not move at all. She could not move. As his steps came closer... She could only stand with her hands pressed over her mouth to keep everything from coming out. Only now she knew that the terror had consumed her voice, that her scream would simply be a louder silence. He seemed to stand outside her door for an age before finally going to his dressing room. Once in bed... Louise's first thought was, why hadn't she run upstairs and gone straight to her mother's room and woken her and told her? But at once she knew that her mother would be very angry, would blame her for being dirty and disgusting, and he, the enemy, would agree, and then it would all be far worse, as though the whole thing belonged to her and had nothing to do with him at all. And perhaps it was her fault. Because if it wasn't, why then did she feel so, so ashamed? Maid of Ale 8641. Hello, it's only me. I hope I didn't wake you. No? Or Evie? 
Uh, no, she's still out with her latest beau. Oh, do you think it's serious? I doubt it. Knowing my sister, it'll be another hopeless crush. Anyway, never mind Evie. Is everything all right? Yes. I'm sorry for ringing so late. I just wanted to hear your voice. Oh, darling girl, you need never apologise. And to say, if there is a war, you wouldn't stay in London, would you? Well, I expect so. There's Evie. What else could I do? Oh, I don't know, but I do know that I couldn't bear you to be there and me stuck down here. Which you would be. I imagine so. I suppose I am tied to my sister in the same way you are to your parents. We have to find a way. To what? To be together. If we are all going to be killed, I want to be with you. Oh, Rachel. I do love you. Me too. I love you too. 